Hello everyone, I'm uh, Dr Stuart Eve and I'm one of the Archaeological Field Directors at Waterloo Uncovered and welcome to the first in a series of talks that we've put together looking basically at the archaeological techniques that we currently use at Waterloo. So we employ a vast range of different techniques on the battlefield. Some of them are very scientific, uh, some of them are more based in historical research, some of them are very heavily uh, computer based and sometimes we just use really really big machines to dig really really big holes. But in this first talk I just wanted to give a general overview of the different ways that we can explore the landscape and the history of the Battle of Waterloo and then in each of the subsequent talks um, I'll drill down a little bit more into the individual methods and look a little bit more closely at what they can tell us and how we also employ them at Waterloo and on other archaeological sites as well. But before we get into the specific methods I just wanted to spend a small moment just thinking about where we dig and why. So the battlefield is a really big place. It's uh, approximately five kilometres by five kilometres. Uh, so it's quite a big battlefield. But when you think of the amount of people, the horses, the equipment, you know, all this stuff carried by three armies, all basically at the height of their powers, is actually not a very big area at all in order to fit everything in. So one of the interesting things about Waterloo is that although it seems like quite a big battlefield, it's actually quite compact, mainly because there are a lot of people taking part. But even though, you know, it's a compact battlefield, there's a lot of activity, it's still too big for us to be able to dig every part of the battlefield to dig in every place. So we first of all need to spend some time just refining the areas that we're interested in and choose some decent targets to uh, to ensure that we maximise kind of recovery of the archaeological evidence. So the first technique that I'll talk about in this series is, a, is really a suite of tools uh, known as remote sensing. So this is a this is a set of techniques that allow us to study the landscape and in some cases even look below the ground but without digging any holes whatsoever that's why it's called remote sensing because we don't actually stick anything in the ground we do everything uh, remotely so using a combination of uh, satellite imagery sensors on planes uh, geophysical machinery historic mapping um, photogrammetry we we start to build up a a picture of the topography and then the underlying geology and that can then indicate to us areas where archaeological remains are likely to survive and also where we're likely to find them. So we gather all of these different types of data together, mostly digital data, and we create this digital map of the landscape and of the battlefield. And then once we've got that map, which we've put together in something called a geographic information system, essentially a bit like a Google Earth or Google Maps, we've got that all of that spatial data into one big place. And then we can hang all of the other data that we excavate from the ground or that we retrieve from metal detecting. We can hang all of that together into one place. So talking about metal detecting, this is another, I guess you'd call it semi-remote sensing. Um, <clears throat> so using a metal detector on site, you'll come across this really a lot at Waterloo and on other battlefield archaeology sites as metal detecting is one of the main ways that we can recover artefacts from the ground, especially from um, from battlefields because a lot of the artefacts, especially in the Napoleonic battles, were, were obviously made of metal. So we're looking for musket balls or, or buttons or buckles and that type of thing. So once we've um, recovered these artefacts, we map exactly where they are. And then as you can see on this slide here, we can map those clusters of artefacts and see if there's any patterning in them. And that patterning of the of the discarded artefacts, they might indicate areas of intense activity, for instance, for us to further investigate. So if there's a lot of intense fighting, people tend to lose a lot of buttons and they tend to fire a lot of musket balls. So we would we would look towards these clusters and map them in order to find out where to open trenches and see whether or not we can find a bit more evidence as we dig down. But of course, with a um, battle like Waterloo, we have a vast array of historical sources as well to draw on. So that might be first-hand contemporary accounts, that might be maps, that might be contemporary drawings or models of the battlefield. And, and of course, there's been absolutely thousands of books written post-battle 
that have analysed in minute detail pretty much every move of every regiment across the field. But with historical sources, we need to remember that there are only one interpretation of the evidence. So even the first hand accounts, you think, oh, you've, you know, someone was there, they wrote down exactly what happened. They've still got that inherent bias of the person who's writing them. And uh, you've got to think about during a battle like Waterloo, every soldier's experience was different, but it was also very localised. So due to the smoke and the sound, uh, the, the lack of communication, basically the general carnage, they would have very little idea of what was going on in other parts of the battlefield. So again, we have to use these historical records basically as small kind of snapshots of evidence, bringing them together with other parts of the data that we've already brought together. And again, we'll just get a, gain an overview of what's happened. And just these snapshots from the remote sensing from the historical records, they can then start to suggest places on the battlefield where we might concentrate our efforts. Finally, we've got the results of previous works on the battlefield that we can that we can work from. There hasn't really been very much previous excavation, um, official excavation at, at, on Waterloo. There have been a few areas, um, <clears throat> but as archaeologists, we always have to record everything that we excavate. That might be through means of drawings or sketches, written records or photographs. As soon as we excavate anything from the ground, and this includes retrieving metal detected artefacts, we're effectively just uh, ripping it from its relationship with everything that's still buried. So this is something that archaeologists call context, it's a very in, uh, important concept. And we'll go into this uh, important aspect, you know, a bit more in a further talk. But just as a quick example, if we um, find a button from uh, metal detecting, and then we just pull it up without marking where we found it or without carefully excavating that area around it. Now we've got no idea if that button is part of a, a uniform or whether there are more buttons uh, nearby or whether that button, it may even belong to a body that's still lying there in the ground, but we've just ripped it out. So we've no idea what else it was buried with. So we have to carefully record everything, feed it all into the project database which in the case of Waterloo, we've published as an open source uh, data set on the internet that anybody can um, visit or interrogate and, and learn from or even uh, contribute to as well. And again, we'll go into this in more detail in one of the, one of the later talks. And finally, we can produce uh, 3D models um, from our results. So like this trench here that I'm showing uh, from the courtyard of Hougamon Farm. So we can produce um, 3D models of contexts or trenches, uh, but we can also do it of artefacts as well. Now these act as obviously a superb kind of interactive documentation, they're really whizzy and excellent, but they're also um, fully to scale as well, so we can measure off them and we can analyse them in, in kind of new and exciting ways and we're really playing with some of this technology uh, as part of the project, so again we'll go into that in a further talk. But basically, uh, hopefully that's given you a little taster for what's coming up in this series of talks. As I say, I'll, I'll delve more into each of these techniques over the next few sessions, and then hopefully by the end of it, you'll have a really good idea of how we work as archeologists, you know, the, the masses of information that we consult and, and bring to bear before we even put a trowel near the ground. And also we're gonna learn about the importance of recording exactly what we do and how we do it. Okay, thanks for listening and um, hopefully I'll see you in the next session.